Hi, my name is Laura, and welcome to my podcast, Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations, and through these discussions, you will hear why, nine times out of ten, the book wins. I'll also share different behind-the-scenes trivia I've discovered in my research, which by learning makes the story all the more interesting. If you love either books, movies, or both, this is the perfect podcast for you. This probably already goes without saying, but there will be spoilers for both the book and the movie in this podcast. So if you plan on reading the book or watching the movie, go do that first and then come back and listen to this. And now without further ado, let's get right into it. Hi, welcome back. I am excited about today's topic. It is The Picture of Dorian Gray, which was written by Oscar Wilde, published in 1890. And the movie I'll be mainly talking about is the 1945 version. So The Picture of Dorian Gray is actually the only book that Oscar Wilde ever wrote. His other works are poetry, plays, including his most well-known, I think, which is The Importance of Being Earnest, which for some reason I thought was Shakespeare, but turns out it's Oscar Wilde. Uh, but So poetry, plays, and short stories. Even though this is the only book he wrote, he gifted us with a timeless story, a timeless character, pun intended. And it's beautifully written. You can tell by his writing that he was a poet because it just flows and just, it's just very eloquently written. While I was reading, I highlighted so many lines and so many passages. As you'll see below in the synopsis, I quoted a lot. That's So the synopsis is kind of long. There was just so much I wanted to include. And there's also a lot of great dialogue between the characters, as well as lots of internal dialogue. And this also shows that he's a playwright, because plays are all about the monologues and the dialogues. So that definitely shows as well. Uh, I feel like a lot of people are familiar with this story, even if they haven't read the book or seen the movie. But for those who don't know, here is a synopsis. So we have artist Basil Hallward, who meets the young and attractive Dorian Gray, and he becomes kind of obsessed with him. And as they say in the book, he idolizes him and he worships him. He asks Dorian to sit for him for a painting. And on the final day of the painting, Dorian meets Lord Henry, a friend of Basil's. And Basil tells Dorian not to pay any attention to what Lord Henry has to say because he's a bad influence on everyone aside from himself. Which is true. Basil somehow seems to be immune to Lord Henry's ideas. I guess he just has a strong enough character that he is not so susceptible to them. Throughout the book, Basil is a figure of goodness and you have lord henry who is on the opposite side anyway while sitting for basil lord henry fills dorian's mind with all these various you know cynical theories on life and very uh superficial things and dorian is very young and he's susceptible to all these things and he's really thinking about it and taking it to heart then basil who hadn't been paying attention to what was being said he's done with the painting and they come over and look at it and it's incredible it's basil's best work and Lord Henry remarks how, how the painting will always be attractive, but how Dorian is going to eventually grow old. That really upsets Dorian, and he says how he wishes the opposite were true. And in the book, he says, I know now that when one loses one's good looks, whatever they may be, one loses everything. Your picture has taught me that. Lord Henry Walton is perfectly right. Youth is the only thing worth having. When I find that I'm growing old, I shall kill myself. So obviously being very overdramatic. And he makes a remark how he would sell his soul in order to have the painting age instead of himself. And sometime after that, Dorian is meeting with Lord Henry again and tells him that he is engaged. And he has fallen in love with an actress who works at this shabby theater. And he says the stage settings and the other actors are all horrible and cheesy. But that the actress, Sybil Vane, is not only beautiful, but she's an amazing actress. Says uh, the line, I have had the arms of Rosalind around me and kissed Juliet on the mouth because she always plays Shakespeare roles. So he's very obsessed with the fact that she's an actress. And he takes Henry and Basil to go see her perform in Romeo and Juliet. But at the play, her acting is terrible, and she's just very monotone. And the audience is even hissing and walking out early, and Henry and Basil even leave early. And Basil is nice about it, but Lord Henry is just very blunt, of course. Earlier in that day, we were shown Sybil interact with her mother and brother, and it just showed how young and naive she was. And she's in love with this idea of what she thinks Dorian is, just as he's in love with the idea of her being an actress. Not really. Neither of them are really love, 
in love with each other because they don't even know each other. They've barely met. Anyway, and then her brother, she's talking to her brother and he's going to be leaving that night. And he says how if this man ever hurts her, he'll kill him. Then back to the theater. So that night, Dorian goes to see her backstage and says how terrible she was. And she tells him that the reason her acting was so bad was because she has now experienced love for real and because she has experienced the real thing when she went out on the stage she saw how ridiculous the play was and she just didn't have the passion in her because she was seeing for the first time just how horrible the other actors were and seeing the reality of it and so because she had no passion for the play anymore because all her passion was for Dorian now and he replies saying that because of this she has killed his love and in the book he says you used to stir my imagination Now you don't even stir my curiosity. You simply produce no effect. I loved you because you were marvelous, because you had genuine intellect, or sorry, because you had genius and intellect, because you realized the dreams of the great poets and gave shape and substance to the shadows of art. You have thrown it all away. You are shallow and stupid. My God, how mad I was to love you. What a fool I have been. You are nothing to me now. I will never see you again. And she even falls on the floor and is crying. And he is just very cold and heartless. And it just has no effect on him. He then goes back to his house where he sees the painting because Basil gave it to him, obviously. And and he notices that it's changed and how the painting now has a cruel smile. And he looks at a long time analyzing it and he realizes that it's changed because of how he treated Sybil and that the painting is starting to reveal who he is. And so he vows to be a better person and that Tomorrow he's going to go back to Sybil and apologize and he realizes how horrible he was and he's going to marry her. Then later the next day, uh, Lord Henry comes to his house and tells him that Sybil has died and that it was suicide. And Lord Henry is very apathetic in the way he tells him and just has no pity at all. And he even says how it's romantic and that he wishes one of the women he has loved would have killed themselves over him. And Dorian says how it just doesn't seem real. It seems like a tragic ending to some play. And Lord Henry once again exercises his influence over Dorian. And they even go out to the opera tonight, that night as if nothing even happened. And Sybil's death is definitely the turning point for Dorian where it really solidifies his previous wish to never age. He says this to himself after Lord Henry leaves and he's just contemplating this whole thing. And he says, and yet... Who that knew anything about life would surrender the chance of remaining always young, however fantastic that chance might be, or with whatever fateful consequences. If the picture was to alter, it was to alter. That was all. Why inquire too closely into it? For there would be a real pleasure in watching it. He would be able to follow his mind into its secret places. This portrait would be to him the most magical of mirrors. It had revealed to him his own body, so it would reveal to him his own soul. And when he had been in love with Sybil, he tells Henry that... Sybil is everything that is good in him. And so her death symbolizes the death of everything that was good in Dorian. And Basil comes over the next day to console Dorian. And he's surprised to see how unaffected he is. And when asked how Dorian could already be feeling over it, Dorian says, a man who is master of himself can end a sorrow as easily as he can invent a pleasure. I don't want to be at the mercy of my emotions. I want to use them to enjoy them and to dominate them. Basil is just so struck at how heartless he has become and it makes you wonder if basil had showed up the previous day you know how would things have turned out instead of it being lord henry but anyway so 20 years pass and dorian lives a life full of pleasure seeking with no regard for others i took a lot of quotes from this book obviously but this one it actually isn't said till later in the book but it nicely summarizes the life dorian has been living it says He knew that he had tarnished himself, filled mind with corruption, and given horror to his fancy, that he had been an evil influence on others, and had experienced terrible joy in being so, and that the lives that had crossed his own, it had been the fairest and most full of promise that he had brought to shame. And throughout this book, a quote that comes to mind in regards to both Dorian and Lord Henry, they lead these pleasure-seeking lives, but pleasure, a life of pleasure isn't a life of happiness, So a quote that comes to mind a lot is misery loves company because neither of them are truly happy. And so what they do is try to drag people down with them and they're successful. And so 20 years have passed, but Dorian and Lord Henry are still friends. However, he hasn't seen Basil much until one night Basil comes over and he addresses all the horrible things he's been hearing about Dorian, all these rumors going around town. And he says how he can't believe it. And one has only to look at Dorian's innocent face to know how ridiculous these claims are because... Of course, Dorian, not only has he not aged, 
but these wicked things he he's done don't show on his face. He just still has this young, youthful, innocent looking face. And then he says, but I guess the only way I could know for sure would be to see your soul. And this line, of course, grabs Dorian and he decides to show Basil the painting, which he had taken up to his old school room at the top of the stairs because obviously he couldn't have it out in public. And he lies and says that it got stolen. So he takes him up there and he removes the cover and Basil sees how hideous the painting has become. And he says that if that truly is the state of Dorian's soul, then he must be even worse than what the rumors are saying. And he tries to get Dorian to pray and tells him that it's not too late to change his life. Dorian is suddenly filled with a hatred for Basil to be telling him these things, and he stabs Basil and kills him. The next day, he calls up a guy he used to know that is now a scientist and apparently works with cadavers or something. They, they don't really get into it, but the guy doesn't want to help him. He wants So he wants the guy's help getting rid of the body, and the guy doesn't want to help him because, you know, they used to have a sort of friendship, and like all the other friendships, you know, he now hates Dorian and has seen what a bad guy he is. Anyway, so he doesn't want to help Dorian, but Dorian blackmails him, and so the guy has to. And then later down the road, we hear that that guy ended up committing suicide. And so Dorian is haunted by the death of Basil, and he turns to his vices to try to forget. And while in this bad part of town, he runs into Sybil Vane's brother. The brother goes up to him and threatens him, but then Dorian is like, you know, what you're talking about happened 20 years ago. Like, look at me. I don't look old enough. And the guy realizes, like, oh, yeah, like, you are too young. You must not be the same guy. So he lets him go. The girl, like, there was a girl who knew that he was going after him. And so she comes up and she's like, why'd you let him go? Why didn't you kill him? And the guy's like, that man, like, looks no older than 22. It can't possibly be him. And she's like, Dorian Gray has looked 22 years old for the past two decades. And so after that... James, James is the name of Sybil's brother. Uh, he starts to stalk Dorian and find an opportunity to kill him. Then later when Dorian is with his friends in the country, uh, we meet this woman, Gladys, who I think is Lord Henry's cousin. I feel like there's a scene where he calls her cousin. But anyway, and people like think that she and Dorian should get together, but they never really have much of a relationship in the book. So anyway, they're all out in the country and they're shooting at rabbits and stuff. And... And a guy accidentally is trying to shoot a rabbit and he ends up shooting a guy that had been hiding in the bushes that he hadn't seen. And it turns out the guy hiding in the bushes had been James Vane, Sybil's brother. And with the death of James Vane, Dorian decides that he really does want to change his life and to not cause any more change to come to the portrait. His first good deed is to cut things off with some country girl he'd been seeing and kind of stringing along, I guess. And so he officially just cuts things off with her and he sees feels like that's the best thing to do and he tells lord henry this and lord henry laughs and says that that wasn't a selfless act and that dorian isn't really going to change and he tells him uh you'll soon be going about warning people against all the sins you have grown tired of so i thought that was an interesting line but dorian is still like no like what i did was a good act and when he gets home he goes to look at the portrait because he's like surely like a positive change has come on the portrait now and so he looks at it and what it says is he could see no change, save the eyes. There was a look of cunning and in the mouth, a curved wrinkle of the hypocrite. The thing was loathsome, more loathsome if possible than before. Uh, and he realizes that his good deed with that country girl wasn't him being genuinely good. And another quote is, through vanity, he had spared her. In hypocrisy, he had worn the mask of goodness. For curiosity's sake, he had tried the denial of self. So when he realizes that, you know, it wasn't even a good act and he was just still not changing he decides he's like well I just need to get rid of this painting like I don't need to look at it anymore it's just this horrible reminder and I don't want to see it anymore so he stabs the painting but when he stabs the painting he himself ends up dying and the painting goes back to looking beautiful and he becomes like you know this ugly old guy and that's how his servants find him and that is the end and so there have been lots of movie versions of this and I chose to focus on the most well-reviewed one, which is the 1945 version. The other ones, like there's a few made-for-TV movies and stuff. And then there's also remakes that go by a different name entirely, but it's the same basic story, but set in a different time period. Uh, and I did watch some of the trailers for the others, and a lot of them just seemed kind of cheesy and poorly done. And then there's another a theatrical release that was done in 2009, and it had Colin Firth as Lord Henry, and when I saw that, I 
thought that he would be a great choice for Lord Henry. So I watched a few clips from that just to see. I really, I can't judge. I literally watched like 10 minutes worth of it, but I felt like he could have been great, but I felt like some of his lines were delivered in too aggressive a way where Lord Henry was just very apathetic. He had like, you know, all these cynical ideas of life, but he wasn't aggressive about it. He was just whatever. But I felt Colin Firth sometimes was a bit too forceful with these thoughts. So I felt like that was inaccurate. The guy who plays Dorian in that is Ben Barnes. And he does look young, so they got that right. But he has dark hair, dark eyes. In the book, Dorian has blonde hair, blue eyes. And I also read the synopsis for that one. And they stray very far from the book. So it's just, yeah, they made too many changes. Anyway, the 1945 version stars Herd Hatfield as Dorian. And funny enough, Herd Hatfield and Ben Barnes were both like 30 years old when they played Dorian. And Ben Barnes still looked young enough to play him but Herd Hatfield definitely looked too old he also had dark hair dark eyes but he also yeah he just didn't have a young innocent looking face like they say how when you see Dorian he just looks so innocent and pure but Herd Hatfield didn't have that look however his, his acting was good though and he did a good job and fun fact this was only his second role ever so he got this lead role his second time and his first role was like some minor character so that's pretty impressive In the beginning, I felt like some of his acting was a bit too wooden, which later on when Dorian, you know, totally goes to the other side, you know, it's fine that he doesn't show emotion because he's just become this heartless person who's just doesn't show emotion. But in the beginning, when he sees the painting and he makes his wish that it could change in the book, Dorian was being very dramatic and he was even crying. But in the movie, he says it again, just in this very wooden tone and you don't feel the passion he has. So that's my critique with that. And Lord Henry is played by, is played by George Sanders, who is a great representation of Lord Henry. He rattles off all these lines and uh, he has the right attitude. Yeah. So he, he's a great Lord Henry. I thought he did it really well. Sybil Vane is played by Angela Lansbury, who was 20 years old in this movie her acting was good and she's she is pretty, but Sybil Vane in the book was like strikingly beautiful. And I felt like Angela Lansbury didn't quite have that kind of beauty. However, she did a good job playing the role, though. She was a really good actress, which you might recognize her because she became famous a little later in life. Like, obviously, she was 20 years old and getting movie roles, but uh, she didn't become like a household name really until movies like, uh, you know, or TV shows like Murder, She Wrote. And then she was in the movie The Manchurian Candidate and then different Disney movies like Bedknobs and Broomsticks and Beauty and the Beast. Although, you know, she was a voice, so you didn't see her. But anyway. Uh, And then Gladys. So I mentioned Gladys. She's in the book briefly. In the movie, she has a much bigger role. And she's played by Donna Reed, which you will recognize from It's a Wonderful Life, which came out the following year. She was actually disappointed because she wanted to play Sybil Vane. But... Gladys was an even bigger role. So I feel like, you know, what was she complaining about? Anyway, so the movie, it's very close to the book. It's a really good adaptation. The dialogue is even, a lot of the dialogue is word for word, the same as the book. It's two hours long, but it went by really fast. So that's good. (laughs) And they had a narrator, which I liked because, you know, for all, there's a lot of internal dialogue, like I said. And so the narrator expresses a lot of that. So one change they made is Basil is painting the picture. He has the statue of a cat and the cat is in the painting. And there's this story about how it's like one of the Egyptians, Egyptian gods and something like they make it seem like the cat is what causes his wish to come true. And so I feel like they put that in there because they felt audiences needed a more concrete reason as to why Dorian's wish comes true. So they added this cat statue in there. Another, I feel like the biggest change they made is with Sybil. So in this, she's not an actress. Uh, She just sings and uh, like she's a vaudeville singer. And the place is even like seedier than it was in the book. In another small change, in the book, she calls him Prince Charming. And in the movie, she calls him Sir Tristan. So I don't know why they made that change. But Sir Tristan was one of the knights at the round table. So it still fits. And she's still... Same as in the book, she still builds him up in her head. You know, she's like, oh, he's my Sir Tristan or Prince Charming in the book. And so she's in love with the idea of what she thinks he is rather than 
trying to really get to know who he is. So in the movie, there's no bad performance. Henry and Basil come to see her and she does great. However, Lord Henry suggests Dorian to do like a test on her to see if she's worthy of him. And in the book, Lord Henry never suggests that. But the test he suggests Dorian do is basically to see if he can get her to have sex before they're married. And if she does, then she's not worthy of marrying and he should dump her. And so Dorian does it and Sybil falls for it and they end up sleeping together before they're married. The next morning, he writes her a harsh letter saying how, you know, she's not the woman he thought he was and he doesn't want to see her anymore. And some of the lines he uses in the letter are from the book, but obviously it's, you know, they changed why he dumps her. So some of the wording is different. I think the book, he was much more harsh because one, it's in person. And two, even though what he does in the movie is horrible, I feel like in the book, it was almost even more superficial and just more harsh because, you know, suddenly he doesn't love her because suddenly she's lost her actress talents or whatever. So I feel like the book, it was even more harsh and more cold. And then, so when Lord Henry tells him of Sybil's death, they do that the same in the movie. So they do a good job with that. Also, something I left out in the book, Lord Henry also gives Dorian a book. And it's a book Lord Henry had written when he was 16. And they don't say what it is, but Oscar Wilde was alluding to some book that really was written. And I guess it just talks about some guy's journey living a life of pleasure seeking, basically. And it fascinates Dorian. And in the movie, he gives it to him again. But then they added a part where Basil gives him a book about, about Buddha or someone, like some positive figure. So as, you know, in the book, we have Lord Henry and Dorian on these opposite sides. Or sorry, I mean, Basil and Lord Henry are on opposite sides. And then they make that even stronger in the movie by even, they each give him a book and these books are opposites. And then in the movie, they have an additional character named David, played by a young Peter Lawford. So this is a guy who wants to marry Gladys, but Gladys is into Dorian. And so David is just suspicious of Dorian. And so they added this character where uh, he's just kind of snooping around Dorian's house, trying to figure out what the deal is with this guy to, in order to convince Gladys that she shouldn't marry him. In the movie, like I said, Gladys is a bigger role and she's in love with Dorian. And she also knew him when she was a girl because... Uh, she is the niece of Basil. And so she was there when the painting was done and everything. I don't get why she's so in love with him. <laughs> I don't know if it's her because she's known him since she was a girl. She like has this idea of who he is or something. I don't know. They also did try to make Dorian more sympathetic and likable in the movie because he does seem to have a more genuine love for Gladys. In the book, Lord Henry asks Gladys if she loves Dorian and she replies saying, I wish I knew. And Dorian never seems to imply that he loves her in the book either. So they definitely built it up way more in the movie. And then another difference, I mean, it's the same when Basil sees the painting. It's basically the same thing plays out. However, I felt like Basil didn't have an intense enough reaction in the book. He like, you know, he even stifles like a scream or something when he sees the painting because he's just so shocked. Whereas in the movie, he like, he looks curious looking at it, but it's not this intense reaction. So I felt like they could have played that up a bit more. So the movie is in black and white, but when they show the painting, it's in color. This is genius because when you see the painting, which I had seen this movie before, I've read the book and seen the movie back in 2015. So this was just a refresh for me. So I knew the color painting was coming, but when you see it, like you just you know, it startles you. And I think I even jumped a little bit because it's this hideous painting and the contrast from black and white to color. So I really like the way they did that. And side note, if you live in the Chicago area, that painting is at uh, the Art Institute of Chicago. So if you're around there and we have coronavirus going on, but if it's open, you should go give it a look. And whenever I end up visiting Chicago, I'll have to go see it because it would be cool to see it in person. Anyway, so... Another small difference with Basil is that in the movie, he starts, he like, he doesn't threaten to tell Gladys, but he says something about how, you know, like, uh, you know, if only Gladys could see this or, or what if Gladys found out or something like that. When Dorian hears that, he feels threatened, like, oh no, he's going to tell Gladys and he doesn't want Gladys to think poorly of him. And so he kills Basil. Whereas in the book, his only motivation to kill him was just that 
you know, Basil was telling him the truth and Dorian didn't want to be hearing the truth and he didn't want to try to change. And so he kills him. Another part they didn't include is that in the book, Dorian confesses the murder to Lord Henry in a weird kind of way. He's like, what if I told you that I was the one to do it? And Lord Henry is like, don't be ridiculous. Like you couldn't possibly do that. And he totally dismisses him and doesn't even think for a second that it could be true. And they got rid of that in the movie. And also with Gladys in the movie, Dorian proposes to her. So they end up getting engaged. And then in the movie, when Sybil Vane's brother dies, Dorian once again wants to be a better person. And in this, his good act is to cut things off with Gladys rather than cutting things off with that girl in the country, cuts things off with Gladys, which speaking of the death of James Vane in the movie, that whole scene in the movie, I really liked. They changed some things, but I liked it. Uh, except for the part when he goes back to the person and he's like, and they're like, why didn't you kill him? And he's like, that guy's way too young. And they tell him that, you know, that guy's looked young forever. And then James is like, well, what's his name? And the guy writes in chalk on the wall what his name is. He writes Dorian Gray. And it's the super overdramatic moment. Like the music is built up and that was a bit overdone for my taste. But aside from that, I did like that scene. After he breaks things off with Gladys, they're off somewhere else, like in the country or wherever. And he sends her a note. Then David shows up and he's like, hey, I've been researching into Dorian. And he has that weird room at the top of the stairs that he keeps locked. But I got in there and there's, you know, it's nothing. It's just an old school room with a creepy painting. And he describes the painting, like how there's the cat in it. And then the signature on the bottom and Gladys and Lord Henry are like, wait a minute, like that, you know, aside from how hideous it looks, that sounds like the painting Basil did. So they go over there to check. And meanwhile, Dorian is there. Another change in the movie, Dorian does see a good change in the painting from breaking things off with Gladys. He sees that a positive change has happened in the eyes and he's motivated by this positive change and continues to want to change his life. And he stabs the painting not as a way to get rid of the evidence, but just as a way to be rid of memories of what he's done, basically. So in the book, he stabs the painting as a way to get rid of evidence and for him to not be reminded of who he's become. But in the movie, he stabs it because, you know, he wants to become a better person and he doesn't want this painting around. But once again, when he stabs it, he dies. The painting becomes normal again, and then he becomes the old man. And then Gladys and Lord Henry and... David get there and they see him lying on the floor and they see the painting and and when they see him lying on the floor, you know, he's he looks entirely different and they're like, oh no. And that's how it ends. The movie did try to make Dorian more sympathetic with his genuine love for Gladys, which I don't I don't mind. Like I thought that was fine. Like it wasn't a change that really bothered me. They actually I feel like they didn't really have any changes that bothered me a ton. Like yeah, I feel like the whole Gladys character was added just to make him more sympathetic. The David character was a bit unnecessary. I feel like that wasn't needed. But even though I still like this movie and I would still watch it again, I still like the book better. It's just beautifully written and, you know, it's just this classic story that I'm sure will inspire even more adaptations in the future. If they do make a newer adaptation, hopefully it's a better one than that 2009 version. And yeah, it's... It serves as a cautionary tale to people who are seeking a pleasure leading life at the expense of others when you lead a life focusing on yourself and not putting anything good out into the world. You know, Lord Henry and Dorian didn't put anything good out into the world where you had Basil, where he was a painter. He was putting works of art out into the world and that's contribute, contributing. Anyway, so yes, the book wins with this one. Even though I still like the movie, I would recommend both though. I would the book and the movie are both really good. So thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed. See you next time. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, head over to my site, whythebookwins.com. You can leave a comment there, and I will be sure to reply. You can also find me on Instagram under the same name, whythebookwins, and you can message me there, and don't forget to follow. And also don't forget to subscribe to my podcast and join me next Wednesday for the newest episode of Why the Book Wins. Why the Book Wins.